Okay, Kevin Dresser, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thanks. Excited to excited to speak with you today. Yes, sir. I'm a big fan of of all you've done at the various programs and and the approach you take. I just want to start with, you know, the uh, the first time you got the call to go out to Grundy. I'm curious how that all transpired. Yeah, wow, that's go that's going back a ways, huh? Um, <laughs> You know, I was in Iowa City. Uh, my eligibility was done in 86, and I was there in 87 and 88. And uh, kind of at that point, deciding if I was going to train for four more years to go to 92, and I wasn't making any money. And um, uh, the people at Grundy actually reached out to our wrestling office at the University of Iowa then and um, tr were trying to locate me. And so we, we hooked up, and uh, I flew out there for an interview, and I guess the rest is history. So I was there from so 88. Hang on here with cauliflower ears. These things just really don't stick. <laughs> I know. These things really don't work very well. Um, so I was there from 88 to 96. It was a great experience, just great people. And, um, you know, it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. And I had heard that you were not a teacher there. So I'm curious, what were you doing? Were you a full-time coach or do you have other projects going on? No, they just hired me to be the full-time coach. So um, they were paying me crazy money to be a full-time coach. So, you know, I uh, I sat around and figured out things to do until 3 o'clock every day. And, <laughs> and then I was really busy from 3 to 7, 7.30. And then I did this, did it over again the next day. <clears throat> <laughs> That's pretty sweet because you're getting an upgrade on the weather. You're getting an upgrade, you know, on the, uh, the ease of competition. I mean, because Grundy was a, a power before you got there too, right? Yeah, Grundy okay. had it going. Yeah, Grundy had it going on. They'd won a couple of state titles um, before I got there, and had a tremendous amount of kids in their youth program, I mean, close to 300 kids in a in a small kind of double A school back then. They've they've shrunk quite a bit since then. But I think you know, for a school that was graduating 140 or 130 kids back then, to have that many kids, I think every uh, boy in the school system tried wrestling at one point. So. Um, you know, I was managing a lot of, you know, they had such a great youth program in place that I just really kind of showed up. And to be quite honest, I learned uh, a lot uh, just by watching the way they put together their youth program. And they really were good at that. And so as a high school coach, when you get, you know, a dozen to 15 uh, ninth, rising ninth graders come up to you in the high school room that have been wrestling for seven years, uh, wow, it's something – uh, you, you take for granted later on when I went to Christiansburg, it was just the opposite. So uh, really? they just had a really, really good system in place. Yeah. So it was more like from scratch at Christiansburg. Yeah. Christiansburg had had wrestling and uh, it's funny that the coach uh, who's passed away now uh, was a good friend of mine. We became friends uh, while I was working at Grundy and he was at Christiansburg. He was probably in his mid fifties then. Uh, coach Underwood and uh, he always used to kid around with me he says hey now whenever you want to leave that job in Grundy and uh, come to Christiansburg uh, he goes I'll step down and be your assistant so that was kind of a joke we all had and I think my first year at Christiansburg I think it, they paid me $1,500 a year that was the coach's stipend um, but ironically enough when I left Grundy I really kind of thought I was done with coaching I moved back here to Iowa got my broker's license got my insurance license and kind of thought I was ready to just to be put a suit and tie on and get in financial services. And after about five months of that, I, I, I went home and told my new wife that this sucks and, and I want to go coach. And at that particular time, you couldn't be a head coach in Iowa. I don't think without a, uh, without the right degree. And I didn't have the right degree. So anyway, uh, I called coach Underwood up one day in October and I said, Hey, I'm going to take you up on that offer because they'd filled my position because I you know, really thought I was leaving. So, Obviously, they filled my position with a great guy, Travis Pfizer, who's still there. Oh, yeah. So, so I so, start, went to Christiansburg, and Christiansburg didn't really have – I think they had 11 kids out for wrestling. No no middle school program to speak of either. A, a very small 25-kid um, youth program across all levels. But they had some really good people in town uh, that jumped in to help me right away. Um, but it was a totally different deal, like no budget. I mean, I think I had $150,000 a year budget uh, as a high school coach in Grundy. And then I got to, yeah, I'm not kidding. Whoa. Uh, yeah. And then I got to Christiansburg and I think our budget was $500 a year. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, wow. I, 
I, I learned how to do it both ways. I, 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 you know, the Grundy people really, I mean, they built a private facility uh, uh, for wrestling. They had all the resources. They just really wanted to eliminate excuses for kids not to win and not to, to be able to go to college. And so uh, the gentleman who started the program there who's passed away recently, uh, Red Robertson, just did, you know, poured a lot of his time and, and obviously finances into making something that was really the community could take pride in. And I mean, they've won probably close to 30 state championships now. So uh, he's wow. really made an impact in that community. So yeah. it's great, great to get to work for a guy like that. I can imagine because you come in there and you're a national champ at Iowa during the, the heyday of the Hawks. You, you guys were, you know, the 86 team was insane. And, and we'll talk about that a little, but you go to you Grundy and you win a state title every year, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, we were eight for eight when I was there. So so that leaves a little bit to be desired. You're like, man, we're at the pinnacle. Like, how do we keep going? And so you decide to move back to Iowa, which I did not know, and try to become an insurance salesman. And so were you actually in the trenches doing the calls and you're like, I just miss coaching or, or like, what, what, what happened there? Yeah, I was doing a lot of stuff. I was doing investments. I was doing insurance. Um, I was building a, a office, a team, hiring people, but you know, I just, you know, I really kind of came after doing it for four or five months and probably just first time I'd ever been out of a wrestling room for that long since I probably was five years old. Um, it just all kind of came back to me and just made a decision that, Hey, this is, we're going to go back and we're going to start all over. So I just had been married a couple months. And my wife was from the Blacksburg area. She's from Blacksburg. So Christiansburg, Blacksburg is right there. So we moved back and started from scratch. And she was working at the time. I didn't have a job at the time, except for that coaching job. And so uh, we started uh, Christiansburg up. Wow. And so once you got into it, were you, did you like hire someone to do the kids club and, and you found guys to do like the freestyle stuff? Like how'd you build the program? Well, um, we, um, we had, we, you know, we had to figure out a way to raise money and you know, I had to figure out a way and really to do it at the level I wanted to do it. I wanted to build a program that was a national power. Um, we had to have finances. We had to be able to travel. We had to be able to attract kids, um, uh, to come out for the sport. I didn't want, this was kind of, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's middle class, the lower middle class to get all these kids to go to tournaments and to do what we needed to do. I couldn't go ask parents for it. So oddly enough, and this is a whole nother crazy podcast, but um, I saw some, some high school football programs were raising a lot of money through bingo of all things. So I started studying that. I think the first year, about, about a year, year and a half after I got hired and I started visiting different places in the state of Iowa and or state of Virginia and Virginia was one of the few states that didn't have any, like they didn't have slots, they didn't have anything. So the only gambling that was really going on in the state of Virginia was if you went and bought a lottery ticket at the convenience store, or if you went to a bingo place. So two nights a week, the state law allowed bingo in a facility. So after studying it a little bit and going and visiting and finding out the numbers, I decided to open up a, a bingo parlor for better words. So two nights a week, and then it, it all had to be volunteers. So our parents volunteered and worked it. And we made, uh, lo and behold, the first year we we grossed $1.3 million in bingo. <laughs> and we got it in the state law was you got to keep 10% of it. So we had $130,000 budget from year one, and it kind of grew. We got, we, got, we got it up to about 150000 So we kind of, what we got from one or two guys in Grundy, we had to work, you know, 50, 52 weeks a year to replace it. But that did a lot of good things for us because it allowed me to hire. I hired Daryl Weber, who was a, also an Iowa national champion. He was a national champion for Iowa in 1996. I hired Daryl in 2000 and we just really took off. He, you know, we thought alike. We came from the same background. Um, and so then kids started moving in from, you know, New Jersey because they found out, hey, if, if we go to this program, we don't have to pay to go to Fargo. We don't have to pay to go to Ironman. We don't have to pay to go to Beast of the East. So we, we really put together kind of a national schedule. And the funds that we raised paid all these travel for all of these kids to go to all these elite level tournaments. So obviously wow. we, started, we started pushing out some Division One and Two and Three wrestlers. 
So it just really grew fast. Uh, uh, when the, when we started making money, um, the, the results followed too. I love how you started one with the, with the finances with, I don't know if a lot of people would think that, but then two, you think big, like you're not, you're not going small potatoes. You're trying to raise, you know, a hundred thousand dollar high school budget. And so you start doing I, the bingo thing is genius. You mentioned one thing I got to ask about the state required you to give 90% back. So what they got the 90% and you kept 10. Well, uh, uh, the biggest portion. So if you grossed, uh, you know, if you gross $20,000 in a night, um, you got to keep a portion of it, but you've had to pay a lot of back in prizes. So, okay. uh, you know, if we had $20,000 in a night, we would pay 15,000 in prizes and keep five or got it. similar. So, yeah, the difference was went to the players. And then there was a little, there was a piece obviously that went to the state. I can't remember that. We actually, the only paid position in the whole bingo operation was a treasurer. So we hired a treasurer slash accountant to manage the books and we got audited. It was very, very, it was a very, very tightly held and run entity because a lot of people had abused it um, because it was, it was kind of a cash cow. Um, so we got audited quite a bit. So it, that was way over my pay grade. So we hired a, <laughs> we hired a treasurer slash bookkeeper to, to submit our records and do all that stuff. So I reviewed it every month um, just to know what was going on, but uh, they, they handled the, the details. And so when you bring in a, a guy like Daryl Weber, who he's been on the podcast, amazing guy. And you know, his yeah. journey, you know, battle and Lincoln and Joe and cutting all the way down that one year, it's like, poof, what, what a, what an animal. So tough. Um, so when you bring in a guy like that, do you say, Hey, we, we want you to build the biggest kids club in the state, or are you bringing him just to run the high school program and the practices? Well, Daryl was my assistant at the high school level, but we both just rolled up our sleeves and did everything. Uh, mm -hmm. he, we, we both worked hard in the youth program, middle school program. Daryl really brought a, a organized strength and conditioning program to us for like the preseason and the postseason. He was super organized, as you can see by, you know, the programs that he's putting out there right now. Um, all of his, his programs for sale online are, are battle-tested and time-tested. It's stuff that, that uh, we did when we were at Christiansburg, and he obviously continued to do great things at Christiansburg when I went to Virginia Tech. So, you know, I've, I've always went out, and I learned at that particular time that, uh, you know, we went out, and I think we paid him $60,000 a year right away to just be an assistant coach. Um, so, you know, close to 60, it might've been 55. I'm not sure what it was, but uh, we paid him pretty good coming in the door. And that's kind of something I've always carried with me is um, I probably have a reputation for overpaying people kind of relative to the, the industry standards, but it's always worked well for me because I just think when people come in the door and they're not uh, concerned or stressing over their salary, I, I think they feel appreciated and, you know, the loyalty is there as well, I think. And Daryl was, Daryl was just, a, you know, he was just a great coach. Man, and you follow another tried and true business principle. You know, when I'm not doing this podcast, I'm, I'm in, I'm in sales, but man, you follow to a T, you bring in great people and you've always done that. Look at your guys now, the great Brent Metcalf, St. John, and then, uh, you know, Tony R Roby. And so like, man, you just, have you, did you learn that from someone or is that something you've always just believed uh, in your core? I probably learned it really, you know, kind of, I told you, I learned a lot of things at Grundy and I learned a lot of things from, from my boss at that time. And I didn't have a lot going on because I, you know, I just was a full-time coach. And so I had a lot of time when I was in Grundy, especially in the mornings. So I would go down to Mr. Robertson's office, my boss, and the Grundy people all know who he is, of course. And I would just hang out in the office in the morning and just kind of observe and see how he handled things and how he, how he did business. And he treated people so consistent and he treated people so good. And, you know, he, everybody that worked for him, uh, he overpaid probably, again, according to industry, industry uh, standards. And so, you know, it's like Tony Roby. Tony Roby, when I hired him, he was the head coach at Binghamton. And um, you know, we shot him a salary and he just said, you know, I, I don't have an, you know, it's really not enough for me to give up this head coaching job. So I went to a donor and found $10,000 more. And, you know, just because I really wanted him because I knew he was good and look at how great he's doing now. Yeah. I um, mean, Tony was a big part of the reason that we had success. So 
you can't do it alone. You know, I've had, I've been, had, had some really successful programs, but uh, if, if you think that if you pat yourself on the back and think it's you, then you're, you're not very wise. It, it takes a lot of people to build a great program. It really does. And, and we have so many good people here at Iowa state, you know, we had some great people at a, at a, um, you can leave that one out, coach. We got a, an a ear pod folks that keeps <laughs> popping out here, which is not uncommon with these wrestling podcasts, but, uh, yeah. um, but no, so I just, it goes, this goes back to having good people. And, uh, so I was fortunate to make some really good hires, yeah. uh, over time. Well, you also pr- kind of proven another, uh, theory, um, untrue that you have to work in the school to get the kids. Like they always said, how are you going to get the football guys, the big boys, if you're not in the hallways, like dragging people around. So did you ever have any issues with that? Not being a teacher in the school? Uh, I kind of tried to turn it around the other way. I had all this free time. So I hung out in the halls a lot and I chased, <laughs> chased kids down. And, you know, I did every, when I went to Christiansburg, Grundy had the ball rolling. So they had you know, their youth program when the state tournament got over a year, we started the little league program and they had like six schools with six different maps. They had a dual meet schedule and they had a coaching staff for each of these six elementaries. I mean, it was such a well-oiled machine. It was crazy. So when I got to Christiansburg, I just copied what they did. And, but the problem was we didn't have any kids. So uh, my first three years at Christiansburg, I did every PE class, uh, in ele- every elementary PE class in the whole school system. It took me about a week and a half to do it, but I did, I got in front of every kid. Um, and that really, we went, I think our first year, now this was before girls wrestling, but we didn't just dis- discourage girls. But I think in 1998, we had like 375 kids in our youth program. What? It really went, went from like 25 to 375. Um, just because <laughs> we had now, within two weeks, 150 of them had quit because they figured out, you know, this wrestling shit's real. Um, but, but we had every, you know, we had everybody excited enough about it. Um, we did a little presentation. It was about 30 minutes. We had the kid in a PE class. We brought in a mat, but you know, so you think about it. So I was like a, a PE teacher for about two weeks. And then we, we kind of, we set it up. So, so at the end of the two week thing, we had a parent's night. And I remember that night at Christiansburg high school, they filled the parking lot because just for a wrestling demonstration and sign up for K to seven. So wow. that's kind of how we kicked, that was kind of how we kicked off the youth program. And then we had to, you know, we had to do it every year just to keep, keep the numbers up. So every, the last week of February, I knew I was going to be a PE teacher, you know? So you do it at, so you would do it after the season. Yeah. That yeah we do circuit. Yep. yep. And again, I, that was probably just copying Grundy. You know, the one thing, especially when you go to a new school that doesn't have a wrestling tradition, you don't want to compete against baseball. You don't want to compete against basketball. So we found a five week window from like basically the month of March that there was nothing going on. And so that's when we, so then after that, we kind of started our club wrestling. So the serious kids, you know, if you have 350 kids in your youth program for five weeks, um, 50 of them really liked it. And that's why you form your wrestling club. Mm -hmm. So we'd, for the kids that really liked it, they could wrestle throughout the summer. Um, and that's how we got, you know, the club started. I love it. I love it. Fundraising, bring in great coaches and, you know, you got to get those numbers in the youth program going and what better way than getting in, get in front of the gym classes. That's awesome. And so, you know, right around this time at Christiansburg, once you guys get rolling, you're winning state titles in 2004, Virginia tech makes a really crazy hire at the time. They bring in Tom brands, what was the momentum and excitement around that hire? Were you shocked by it? I, I know the momentum was great. And I was, you know, I was pushing hard. You know, I'd been a Virginia Tech wrestling football fan since, shoot, the, in the early 90s. I started going to Virginia Tech football games. I had season tickets. Um, so I really became a – I went and got an apartment. I coached in Grundy, but I had an apartment also in Blacksburg because I was single and that was just my – way to get out and, and uh, get out of town, you know? Um, so I was a big fan. So uh, when that job opened up and I heard they were going to really put some resources in, they actually called me and asked me if I was interested in the job. <clears throat> I'm like, well, you know, what is the job? So I heard a little bit of the terms about it. So uh, they started talking to me and I kind of had an interview, I guess. 
Um, but then they bring in, then I find out that Tom Brands is interested. And so I called up Tom and said, man, I'm just telling you, this is like, a, a, this would be a great job. Like you could really, this is a gold mine just because of where it's at in the country. I mean, you're close to Pennsylvania, you're close to New Jersey, you're close to Ohio, and you're on a beautiful campus and you got great weather. And, um, you know, it's not a crazy hard school to get into. So uh, that was, you know, so when Tom came, I was excited because I saw the, you know, the, the level of, for once, Virginia Tech was, uh, you know, they were going to get 9.9 scholarships for previously. They only had four. Mm-hmm. So there was just a lot of good things happening. And then he was there one full season, two full seasons or just one full season? I think he lived there a year and a half, but two full seasons. But he, I don't think he lived in Blacksburg probably more than a year and a half. Yeah. And, and obviously everyone remembers that recruiting class he brought in was awesome. You know, you had the Slate and Metcalf and, you know, uh, the, Leclerc, of course, and uh, you know, Porchell. Club, Porchell. Yeah. yeah yep. So really good. Yep. Must have been like sh- everything's looking good. And then, you know, of course, you know, everyone knows what happens next. They let Zaleski go and Brands is, is hired in Virginia Tech. You know, some of the wrestlers didn't get to go. So there's a lot of, a lot of pain, I think, still around that. But um, from what I read, Virginia Tech was so fed up that they were ready to drop wrestling at the time. Well, I can't, I, but I did. You're right. I, but I didn't know that at the time. I, I knew that. I knew that they were reeling a little bit. Uh, I, I kind of was on the inside of that whole thing before I even got hired because the, the associate uh, athletic director, like the guy that was second in command was a guy named Dave Chambers, who was a former Iowa football player. He was like a year or two older than me. So I knew Dave. So Dave was calling me back and forth and I was trying to bring in, and I was helping him bring in candidates. I mean, I had Jim Zaleski lined up to interview for the job. As crazy as that sounds, Whoa. Like Jim was supposed to fly in uh, like on a Tuesday morning and Jim called me and goes, Hey, um, you know, I, I'm not going to come in. Uh, uh, I just, I, th- I think I'm going to take this Oregon state job. So I called up Dave and I said, Dave, I think Jim's got a job. He's canceled. And, and so Dave was like, shit, what are we going to do here? You know, we got all these people up in arms. And, um, I said, I don't know. I said, no, I'll try to find you somebody else. And, um, the AD at the time then called me about an hour later and asked me if I would come over to his office. And, uh, so I came over that afternoon and, and, uh, I, I, he, I remember him asking me what I said, well, whatever you do, you, whether it's bad publicity, it's right now, Virginia tech's on the map because of all this stuff that's happening. I said, um, don't drop it. I said, you got a lot of, a lot of momentum right now that you created and literally said, well, would you take the job? And so that's how, that's how uh, the conversation started right there. So I'm like, well, what's the job? What's the salary? You know, we, so we started talking and I think he hired me the next day. Wow. And did you have any, uh, like any hesitations about it or are you excited about it? Uh, oh yeah. I was excited about it after I went home and thought about it, you know, and talked to my family about it. I was excited about it. Um, it really did kind of hit me off guard because it wasn't even open. They hadn't opened the job. Tom had just literally left every, and all the turmoil was going on about all the you know recruits leaving. And so I was really kind of just a consultant in that thing. That's what they were really using me for was a consultant to, to bring some people in. Like I said, Jim Zaleski and I were teammates and were and are still good friends. And so I asked Jim if he'd be interested and he was, and he was you know set to fly out. He had a ticket and everything. Wow. And he called me that morning and said he wasn't coming, that he got the job at Oregon State, but it hadn't been announced yet. So mm-hmm. keep it under your keep it under your hat. So uh, we kind of got went had to go back to square one. And anyway, that's the that's the rest of the story. I love though how you you're so good at building relationships that even though you weren't like in the college coaching ranks for 18 years, and really when you were at Christiansburg, you're building relationships with with people at Virginia Tech and and around the wrestling world and. You know, you're you're giving advice, you're helping them, and so that when the opportunity did open up, you know, you were the guy. So how uh, how similar or dissimilar is it to kind of starting from scratch at Virginia Tech as it was at Christiansburg? Uh, it was similar in the fact that we were starting from scratch, and so you know, my first couple of years at Christiansburg, we got the crap kicked out of us, and you know, the same thing happened at Virginia Tech. It's hard to fake it when you don't have good wrestlers, right? <laughs> so. Uh, uh, but you're, you know, you're trying to build and you're trying to, you know, put, put systems in place so you can start winning. Um, so 
you know, probably the struggles that we had the first couple of years at Christiansburg maybe hardened me or toughened me up. So, you know, we got 81st place in the nation my first year at Virginia Tech and 81 teams qualified. The next year we got 79th in the nation and 79 teams qualified. So <laughs> we didn't we didn't win a match even in the constellations until my third year at Virginia Tech. So that's a long time to coach and not have a win at the NCAA tournament. And from everything I read and hear, like you were, that they say like the mayor of Blacksburg, like you were just on top of the world before you took this job. And then three years in, you're, you know, even though you know you're building something, it, it sucks to lose. And it, it's a lonely feeling. So were you having any like moments of doubt, you know, as you're in those first couple of years about taking the job? Um. You know, probably not really. I mean, I've just, uh, you know, I've always probably been that guy that even as an athlete, when, when somebody was kicking my butt, you know, I always tried to find the silver lining. Um, and so um, I just saw the potential in Virginia Tech and Christiansburg and Iowa State. And, you know, I, I see the potential and, yeah. and then you put your head, head down and go to work. And all of a sudden you look up every couple of years and you see progress. And, um, you know, that's what we saw at Virginia Tech. But you know, I had a lot of good good people around me too that uh, that helped us do that. When you said you look for the silver lining, you know your first three years at Iowa, you did not make the lineup. You know, granted these were some of the best teams we've ever seen, but you know you went on to win a national title as a senior, took fourth as a junior. But um, you know during those first three years, again being a state champ in Iowa, it was probably tough being on the uh, not being on the on the main lineup. Um, could you give us a sense of what uh, your early years at Iowa were like back in that uh, that heyday? Well, that was extremely hard, especially year two and three. I think when you come in as a as a freshman, you're excited, and um, I think it's natural to be you know be excited that you're there and um, uh, and just be being part of something and being around all those great guys. You're probably a little starstruck at first, but then you get competitive and you want to be the guy. Um, uh, you know, it's funny everywhere I go now in terms of being, getting introduced as a wrestler, they introduce you like a two-time Big Ten champ, um, two-time All-American, fourth in the nation, national champ. I was amateur wrestling news wrestler of the year that year. Um, but what they don't know is that my first three years, I was 0-5 in wrestle-offs. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, had some good things. I was I, you know, I won a couple good open tournaments, but I never wrestled in a starting lineup at Iowa for three years. The first three years, obviously one of those ended up being a redshirt year, but mm -hmm. so I lost a lot of wrestle offs. I um, had some really good guys in front of me, Lenny Zaleski, Jeff Kerber, uh, I had some really good guys in front of me, but I still wasn't the guy. And, and, you, and when you're a competitor, you go there to be the guy. So I learned a lot about myself in those three years. Uh, and then what I learned is that I would have never won the title and I would have never did what I did those last two years um, if I didn't go through all those hard things. So uh, while you're going through them, you don't realize that there's a lot of benefit in going through them if you if you interpret it the right way. Uh, and, you know, I kind of wish kids were a little bit more like that now. And that you know, I, I tell my team every now and then, this is my I was my eighth semester out of 10 semesters in college before I got on the podium. Um, and wow. my seventh semester before I even started and ran out there at Carver Hawkeye arena, you know? So I watched for seven semesters before I got that opportunity. And like you said, though, it's all about how you interpret the events. Did you have that kind of perspective back then? Or were you calling home saying, dad, this maybe isn't for me or. I know that third year was really hard for me uh, not making the team. Cause I thought I was the guy and I just wasn't winning the wrestle off, you know? Um, I was doing great. You know, I placed fourth in Midlands that year. Um, I think I got third in the Northern Open. You know, so I was, you know, I was winning, but I just wasn't the guy. I was just a better guy in front of me. Um, but now I know, and looking back and after coaching, I realize what, what made me uh, probably win a national title and do what I did my last three semesters of college was all that adversity that I had to deal with and, and, uh, you know, just being such a competitor that, you know, I wanted to beat those guys so bad uh, that I was this close, but I wasn't there yet, you know? Yeah. And then when you, when you did, I mean, doing it in 86 at Carver must have been just oof, unbelievable experience. 
yeah, you know, I kind of got lucky. And it's funny when I heard that the NCAs were going to be at Carver uh, in like 84, whenever they announced it was going to be at Carver. And I spent a lot of time running in the mornings and on top of the, on Carver, like uh, that's where we had a lot of our morning runs and our, and our training. Uh, uh, that was a real motivator for me on those 12 degree mornings or 12 below zero mornings uh, <laughs> running on the top of Carver and, 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 and visualizing wrestling down there uh, in 1986. So it was cool that it, it turned out that way. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the guys on that 86 team that, you know, literally larger than life in every sense of the word, Royce Alger, I can't believe he made 58s that year. He probably can't either. <laughs> because he, <laughs> he was a big, he was a big dude, but at that particular time, he couldn't beat Marty Kistler. Marty Kistler was a stud. So, you know, it's just, that was the beauty of the Iowa program. Uh, you know, you, you kind of got the feeling that if, Hey, if I make this lineup, it's not, you know, if I'm going to be an all American, it's where I'm going to be in the podium Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we had nine and eight, and nine all Americans every year. And, you know, in my junior year, we had four, five in the finals, I think, and four win. And then in my senior year, we had six in the finals and five of us won. So you know, <laughs> we just knew that, uh, uh, you know, back in that day, I mean, I was on five national championship teams and, and the tournament was won uh, before Saturday morning, all five years. It was wrapped up. Wow. So that was kind of the, the dominance that Gable had at that time. Kind of feels like watching Team USA now at this world championships. I mean, they're just like. Yeah, just rolling. Rolling, man. It's not even, yeah, just rolling. Not even fair. And so now you're obviously at one of the great programs in college wrestling, Iowa State. And it's just been a, a, it's a rise for you guys every year, you know, gain a momentum, bring in recruits and, um, you know, I think you're in your sixth year now, coach. Yep. Starting our sixth year. Yeah. So, um, one of the things I've noticed that you do a lot of is like community events. Like some programs have like one golf outing, you guys have like four or five and I see you guys are going out a lot. So what's your strategy for kind of revitalizing the fan base and the donors and the alum? But really two things. I mean, the motivation for that is what you just said is, you know, every golf event we go to, there's 150, 200 people at least. Um, we did something at a bike, a place called the Trestle Trail here, uh, just just uh, south of campus. Uh, it's, a, it's a real popular bike trail in central Iowa. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the owners is a big wrestling fan and he wanted to bring the team out. And I said, well, let's just make it an outing. And I think we had four or 500 people out for that. So it's really good for our athletes to get around uh, the fans. It motivates them because they see just how important wrestling is. So it's good for, it's good for my team. Cause I make our team come to these. Um, uh, they have to get up in front of, they have to say their name and where they're from at all these events, which they probably do seven or eight times a year. Um, so it's good for them. It's good for the fans. They love to be it, around it. I think we sell more season tickets. We sold more season tickets last year than Iowa State's ever have ever has sold season tickets. Wow. Um, I mean, uh, we were third in the nation in home attendance last year. So all that stuff. And then obviously from the other side of it is we got to raise money. Like um, we got a heck of a staff here. We got a fourplex we bought, a really nice fourplex we bought a couple of years ago in West Ames to house. And we got some RTC guys staying there for free. Our Some of our team members stay there. They pay. Obviously, per NCAA rules, they pay rent out there, but it's just kind of a nice wrestling uh, place. Really, they, like a little they, hub? Yeah, it's like a. It's a. They basically have a whole building, um, and so it's four units in there. I think there's two two bedrooms and two three bedrooms. So we invested in that uh, as an RTC, and um, and now you know you, you can you your RTC can be a lot more involved in in your own athletes and in, in events. So it's permissible for your RTC athletes to get paid to go to events and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. um, and more than anything, it's just, it's a fundraiser. You know, we like to, we, 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 we got to raise money. If, if you don't think it takes money to win in college wrestling, you're naive. And uh, that's what we got to do. Do you own any bingo halls in Ames, Iowa? No, you know what? But if the state rules were like they were in Virginia, I might. <laughs> the state rules in Virginia were set up that you could really make a lot of money in bingo. So. We might need to get a, I'm from the quad city area and I don't know, it, it wasn't like this when I left, but uh, now they have those uh, the slot machine things everywhere. They have those, these little slot machine. I mean, all it is, it's like in the strip mall, all you do is go in and play slots. It's like, 
I mean, I don't, I don't get it, but maybe that's the new angle. I don't know. <laughs> well, that would have killed us back in the bingo days if they would have brought in any other type of gambling. That would have, that would have taken part of our our market away. And so I'm glad there was no, nothing in Virginia. <laughs> really, the only the only way you could get uh, that you could fix that you could take care of your gambling fix was to come to a bingo hall. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now I want to talk about a couple of guys in your team now. And, uh, you know, just before I even get to that though, your coaching staff, again, it's just, it's so amazing to see these, these guys who used to be not only Hawkeyes, but like the definition of the Hawkeyes that didn't talk to no one, never smiled. Then I have Brett Metcalf on the podcast and he's like the nicest guy you've ever met. So it's uh, it's just amazing to see you bring some of these guys across the state in your program and obviously the number one guy we got to talk about, David Carr. I mean, just a, a stud. Um, what's it been like watching him grow over the past couple of years? We, we we all knew David was, you know, had the potential to be a great wrestler. I think everybody, I mean, he was a blue chip kid out of high school. You can just see how athletic he is. Um, but what I didn't realize was all the other stuff that he brought. He's, bring, he's brought to our program. He is truly the ambassador of Iowa State athletics uh, in any sport. I mean, any I have, sport. I have I have all the other sports hit me up all the time. The coaches, when they have recruiting weekends, especially this time of year, they want to know if they could use David to speak to their recruits and their parents. Um, he's a super communicator. He's just a great kid. I mean, he's he's probably a better kid than he is wrestler, and that's a that's a lot to say, but. Uh, he is, uh, you know, super involved he, in, 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 you know, recruiting. He wants, he wants to talk about what kids were recruiting. He wants to know what he can help, how we can help within the rules. He just, uh, he's going to be a great coach. And, you know, he's got a lot of years of wrestling. He's probably a guy that's going to stick around for another 10 years, you know? Yeah. I mean, think about him being an RTC athlete for you guys. And, you know, just that having that kind of energy and charisma around the program is awesome. Yeah, you know, and I just, it's amazing. Like, we got recruits coming in this afternoon. Uh, when the parents leave, nine out of ten of them just say, man, that kid right there, like, he's unbelievable. They take the time to single him out because he's, uh, he just, uh, he's very real. You know, you get what you see. He hugs everybody. He shakes their hand. He's, he is, he's the mayor of Ames, so. <laughs> Wow. And it's cool that other sports are tapping on the wrestlers to help with, uh, in this case, David Carr, but to help with uh, selling the sell in Iowa state. Yep. David's great at building his brand. You know, if you follow his social media, it's, it's clean cut, it's professional, it's motivating. Um, and it's big. I mean, he's, he has, I think the, the next closest persons, he might have a hundred thousand followers might be 25 or 30, you know, yeah, he just got a great. Uh, he's got a great. He spent a lot of time building his brand, you know, and he he gets that. Yeah, and he seems like just from watching him at the nationals, an ultimate team guy. So he he's all in, which is kind of ironic because you hear all the time to be a great wrestler, you have to be selfish. But he and like uh, you know, there's a number of guys I'm thinking about, but he especially really kind of breaking that mold on that end. Yeah, he's a he's a special kid. And you know, when you look at, and you know, you're. A, your approach you got you're getting guys from everywhere you got a russian you got some guys from california um younger bastida man what a what a lot of energy to watch that guy and you know i'm just curious you know when you bring someone like that in is your plan to say hey we can get get by without teaching you top and bottom because you're so good on your feet or is the plan to say we're going to go full in top and bottom just like you're a folk style guy coming from you know the midwest no we were pretty much you know, all in, in terms of teaching him top and bottom, because if you, you know, if you think you can't, you can win just on your feet in college, you're naive. You got to be able to get away. There's so many guys that are good at turning and riding time and one point matches. And so uh, he's continued to work at it. He's better. He, I promise you, he's going to be better in the top and bottom this year than he was last year. Is he great there yet? No, but he keeps getting better. He keeps wanting to learn it. He's excited. He wants to ride guys this year. He wants to turn guys. Um, he's very verbal in his goals and what he wants to do. Um, so he's he's going to be a handful. I'm telling you, like this dude is, uh, and, and he's got that he's got that it factor inside of him too. He might be a nice guy when when you see him at the 
at the golf tournament, but if you step across the mat from him, he's going to want to tear your head off. <laughs> he, he, he's got a mean streak that you need in this sport. I love it. He's going for blood. That's awesome, yep. man. Yep. Well, it's cool to see uh, you just all the personalities you have on the team. I know when you were at Virginia Tech, you used to have dual meets in the theater. And, I, you know, I don't know if that's feasible at Iowa State because you have so many fans. But uh, do you have any uh, promotional things like that planned for this year and next year for the uh, for the team? Uh, no, Hilton's just such a great place to wrestle. And, and people are so familiar with it that we don't want to uh, – I don't think we want to veer too far from there. We did do the dual meet at my hometown yeah. last year that was really successful. So we'll do that again. Um, it just it was a great, great event. It's it's funny the the guys after they left, and especially David goes, man, coach, like we wrestled in some really cool places. We wrestled at Gallagher, obviously wrestled at Carver, and a lot of good wrestling venues. He goes, but that is like one of the coolest just because it was so intimate, and everybody was right on top of you. So it's a high school gym that seats. 1300 and we had 1400 in there and so uh really a loud environment and the people are literally sitting right up to the mat so uh we decided we're going to do that again this year with grandview who's obviously a really good uh you know the best nai program out here so we're gonna we're gonna be good for their program be good for the state be good for humble um yeah i think it's just a win it's a win-win for everybody yeah and i had read that like tickets sold out day of when you announced that last year with purdue yeah, I think they put it up in seats, like I said, 1,400, and they had 4,500 ticket requests the first day, so they had to do a lottery. Wow. So, that's Yep. Those humble people, they follow they follow their sports. And when you were coming up through, I know you won a couple state titles for them, but was Wrestling King back in the day at Humboldt? It's always been – they're really in all their sports. Like, they support everything. It's really a tight-knit community, and they support everything. So, yeah, we had – I remember my, you know, we, they'd have a one whole floor at a hotel in Des Moines every year for the state tournament. So it was a, a social event, but it was very well, very well attended. Yeah. That's cool to hear that. And you know, Grandview, I can't imagine, you know, the number of Iowa guys they have on their roster probably going to be uh, just as much action and activity with the fans to see all those guys compete. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be sold out. It'll be a fun day. It's earlier this year. It's, in, it's right before Thanksgiving and last year was right before Christmas. So I think we go on November 20th this year. And you guys aren't messing around with the schedule this year, Coach. You're heading down to Florida to do the uh, the event with Bono, and then uh, the All Star Duels is back, which is all or the All Star Meet is back is awesome. And then you're doing the Dual Meet tournament in New Orleans, yeah. Um, Southern Scuffle, Southern so Scuffle, yeah. And yeah, plus, and of course, yeah, you know, we got some we got Arizona State coming in, we got Oklahoma, Oklahoma State coming in, so we got a yeah, we got a really good schedule this year. I Going see my Illini are coming in too. Yep, yep. I, I've we'll never go, we'll seen that Dual Meet. Yeah, we, we'll go back to them next year. So Coach Poeta uh, reached out to me when he first got hired and said he wanted to figure something out. So I said, let's go, yeah. Wow. And then the the probably my favorite dual meet of the year to watch, besides Iowa, Iowa State, is ISU UNI, as you call it, the Schwab mob. Where's that one at this year? Well, because of the we got a new team in the Big 12, they kind of scrambled our schedule a little bit. So we're going to Missouri again this year, and we're going back to UNI again this year. So um, they'll come to us the following year. So, yeah, that's – I mean, Coach Schwab does a good job. Um, I like to pick on him and make fun of him a lot that particular week. <laughs> so um, I'm going to do that again. And uh, But, you know, he always – especially when we come to town, he has them ready to go. Like, those those kids wrestle hard, 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 hard. <laughs> um, Man. And if, you, and if it's in West Gym, it's the heat and the radiators. That's a whole other factor. I don't know whatever happened with that whole – save West gym thing, but last year, I don't think it was at West gym, right? No, they sold out the McLeod center, which was probably, you know, cool. I mean, I, I, I kind of like West gym. It's hard, you know, athletes that aren't used to it. It's a big adjustment for them because they're not used to that intimate hot gym, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, the McLeod center also was pretty cool just because I think it seats 6,000. So there were 6,000 people there to watch us wrestle you and I, um, I think it's good for the sport. And I think, you know, we, selling it out i'm sure that the wrestling program benefits from some of those revenues so the more i get on social media and make fun of schwab the more tickets they sell sell and the more money goes to schwab's group so it's good, it's good for all of them <laughs> definitely will we see coach brands in your crosshairs this year coach well we'll see him in carver hawkeye arena so we'll see what that looks like you 
you never know what happens uh, when, you, when you get there, but, but, but we're looking <laughs> forward to it and we're looking forward to it. I'm sure it'll be a, a, a lot of energy in the airwaves that day. <laughs> that's a, that's an understatement as always, you know, yeah. th- that's a, yeah. such a fun duel. And and plus you guys got coaches that aren't afraid to get right up in there. And uh, you know, so it's going to be awesome. I know uh, you're not shy about your intentions of, of winning and bringing a national title back to Iowa state and, I just love the uh, the example you set for wrestling because you do it, you know, your way, and it's not kind of the same way it's always been done. You're innovative, whether it's you know the Moss Center or doing duels at a high school. It's it's all good for wrestling, and uh, you've been wanting to have you on for a long time. So I really appreciate you coming on. The the one question we always ask our guest coaches, you know, how did wrestling change your life? That's the name of this podcast. But you know, for coaches who are in it, it's kind of an awkward question because they're like, "This is my life," but. You've seen a lot of guys you coach go on to do great things, I'm sure, whether it's guys you coach in high school or guys you coach at Virginia Tech or Iowa State. So, you know, what's something that you've seen wrestling give these guys outside of the more cliche things, the hard work, the discipline um, that you've seen over the years? Well, I think, uh, you know, the whole the whole uh, Sport revolves around how you deal with adversity and how you deal with hard things. Um, and that's life. Um, so, you know, Coach Gable's poster, once you've wrestled everything else and life is easy, that might kind of sound cheesy, but it's probably really true. That uh, That's the thing I think that wrestling does more so than any sport. You know, when you get out there, even in practice, you can't pass the ball, you can't call a timeout. Um, uh, you can't do that in a wrestling match and you can do that in almost every other sport. So when things get hard, you got to figure it out. Um, and, um, you know, along with that, you're, you're cutting weight. You're not eating like every other college student or high school student or middle school student. Uh, so there's a lot of things you got to balance in there and still perform. Um, uh, like I said, just, just the, you know, that you got the team component, but the individual component I think is what really separates wrestling that you're just you're out there by yourself and uh uh, i think once you overcome that uh and you leave that especially as a college wrestler and you go through a five-year college program that's really hard to do i don't care whatever level you're at um when you get out in the work world you should be able to handle just about anything yeah it's also uh kind of along those lines the team and the the individual concept is you know because you know, sometimes you're not the guy you can go to practice and get through, but I think it really teaches you to be intentional about the practice. Like each day, you know, like you're focusing on something and that's what you're going to get better at that day. And it ha- most of the time has to come from within. Absolutely. You know, we tell our guys all the time, you have to figure out how to be good at three thirty. You can't just go across the street at Hilton Coliseum and fake it. If you haven't done it in here, you're not, it's not going to just show up there. I don't care how hyped you are. I don't care how much of a gamer you are. If you don't put in the time here and you don't really come ready to go at 3.30 and you're not intentional and you haven't set yourself up well for 3.30 based on your sleep, who you hang out with, what time you go to bed, what time you put your cell phone away, what you ate, if you don't handle all those things and do really good with that so you can be really good at 3.30, you got no chance to be really good at Hilton. So that's the struggle always is trying to get kids to understand that Really, you get, you know, they hand out the awards at the NCAA tournament every year, but you win your award in that practice room. And, um, you know, I, I think this team that we've got now is figuring that out and, and, and come, you know, the majority of them come really ready to go at 3.30. Well, and like you said, like back in the day when you were wrestling, guys would pick practice partners like three, four days out sometimes. Absolutely. Like, that's Absolutely. crazy. Well, that's really intentional thinking is that you'd pick a partner because you want a certain look or you just want a tough guy. Like I, I mean, there's guys that would literally line me up for, to train with a uh, week out, you know, like the, I'll wrestle you next Monday. Don't, you know, don't, don't take nobody else. Uh, Which and, means uh, you got one partner for an hour and a half live go. <laughs> yeah. That was the way it was. Jeez. That's yeah, crazy, that man. Well, well coach, it's good to have you on. I know it's the first time we've chatted, but you know, we'd love to make it out for an event. And uh, if I do, I'll, I'll let you know and come say what's up and you just greatly appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure they can grab you media pass here. So just hit me up and we'll have our guy get a hold of you and you can jump in on a media pass. 
That's awesome. Thanks, coach. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Take care.